G20. I would say more like a G7 because, <laughs> you know, I don't no. I don't really see what, what purpose it holds, given the fact that a lot of uh, powerful nations and powerful leaders of those nations just decided not to, to show up. Uh, they may have done some Zoom video call-ins, but, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of leaders just said, you know, we just don't care. And then, then you have uh, all the leaders jetting off in their private jets and their massive uh, entourages and <laughs> going to... Uh, to the climate summit in uh, in Scotland, the COP twenty six hosted by Boris Johnson. And uh, what do you make of these two events, Alexander? Well, they're just they're just empty events which will achieve and change nothing. I mean, there'll be an awful lot of preaching. <laughs> the administration, the U.S. administration, the Biden administration is going to wag its finger at all sorts of countries and say, you know, you're not doing what you should be doing, and you know, we should be doing more. Um, and those countries are going to say, well, you know, if you want to talk to us like that, you want to lecture us in that kind of fashion, we're not interested, and we're going to stay away. We we absolutely accept that there is a problem. But we're going to sort it, solve it in our own way. And that's what the Chinese have said. That's what the Russians have said. Boris Johnson has been working the phones, trying to persuade the Russians and the Chinese to participate fully in these in these summits, both G20 uh, in Rome and COP26 in Glasgow. And the Russian and Chinese leaders stayed away. And Biden has been complaining about this. He's been grumbling about this. But ultimately... It is a totally predictable consequence of the collapse of the international system that we have seen since the new administration came into office. What it has done is it comes along and says, it said right at the outset that it it wanted to work with the other great powers on issues that are important to the United States whilst taking a confrontational attitude to the other great powers on issues which they consider important. It refuses to acknowledge their red lines in the Asia-Pacific region, in Ukraine and all the rest. And unsurprisingly, the Russians and the Chinese say, well, if you want to play the game in that kind of way, we're not going to play with you at all because we don't see why we should be the ones always to give the ground and make the concessions to things you care about when you show no interest in working with us on those things that we care about. And the result is a total collapse in the international system. I mean, it's very bizarre. I mean, it's a weird way of conducting foreign policy and diplomacy. And we see the results in these two completely empty summits today. By the way, not just the Russians and the Chinese who failed to come. The Japanese weren't there in any force either. Their prime minister, Prime Minister Kishida, remained in Japan because, of course, Japan decided to call elections at this time. And I suspect that they could have found ways around that, but they decided they weren't going to bother (laughs) because from their point of view, again, why would they waste their time with an empty show? No, it just shows that we are at this moment in a, a two polar, a bipolar world. Yeah, it, it's that yes. simple. It and, is, and you know, starting with Russia and, and China, they just they just don't care. I mean, they no. really, really don't care in these ridiculous COP twenty six meetings, these these G twenties, which is really nothing more than than the U.S. showing up and, and just kind of bossing Europe around, <laughs> and uh, and then just you know. Uh, trying to, to lecture Russia and China about about their values, whatever the hell that means. Yeah. They just don't want to hear it anymore. They no. don't care. No. And with Biden at the helm, they laugh. I mean, they they really laugh at at what's going on in the White House. And so it's, it's a waste of time, plain and simple. For them, it's just a complete waste of time. We are in a bipolar world, full speed ahead. This is where we Absolutely. are. This is where we're moving. Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, I should say that there's been some talk now about how the, you know, the U.S. is going to pressure these countries to change their views. And the latest idea, brilliant idea that we're hearing, which has been spoken about both in the British media and in the U.S. media, is to impose carbon tariffs, which is to say to impose tariffs on goods imported to the West into the West by countries that don't carry out 
the will, don't do what the Western powers want on uh, green issues, on those sort of issues. Well, just think about what the effect of that would be on inflation. <laughs> if, we, if we suddenly found that all those goods, all that oil, for example, and grain that comes from Russia, all those manufactured goods from China, if they were suddenly subjected to those kind of tariffs. And at the same time, you see that the administration tells us that it wants these countries, especially the Russians, to do more action to bring inflation under control. It is surreal. The entire thinking is as an unreal quality. It, it, it reflects magical thinking increasingly. And you're absolutely right. The countries in question, they just have reached that point where they've concluded that there's no point any longer in trying to talk with these people, in trying to reason with them, because they're not reasonable. They're not serious. So why waste time talking with people who are not serious? All they know how to do is, is sanction and put restrictions and put regulations and tax. That's all they know how to do. They, they don't have any real solutions for no. anything. No. And, and people are really supposed to believe that Joe Biden and Macron and Ursula van der Leyen are going to solve the world's climate issues. Really? No. Exactly. It's, it's beyond laughable. It really is beyond laughable. I mean, it sounds to me a carbon tax, listening to you, Right away, my mind says another wealth transfer, either very large multinational corporations are going to figure a way to sidestep it, or they're going to pass on the tax to the customers, in which case the middle class and the lower class is going to pay more. Obviously, inflation prices are going to go up. Or I'm thinking if you're a small to medium sized business and you're having to work in a global environment, you're going to get screwed with the carbon tax. So, I mean, at the end of the day, all these mechanisms, not only do they not work, but you're looking at, once again, a, a way for, for these globalists to destroy small to medium-sized businesses, to pass on taxes to the lower and middle class, and they're not really solving any of the core issues that they themselves are preaching about. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're not going to solve any of the core issues that they're preaching about because their policies... Are, 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 are totally impractical. They're declaratory. <laughs> There's no conceivable sense in which these are real policies. But as you absolutely rightly say, what they do know how to do is to sanction and fine and tax. And they're going to do that to an increasing degree. And it, it, it is crushing businesses. Um, I you know, live in London, I travel around London, I've been listening increasingly to small business people and they've been complaining to me about the way in which taxes, now business taxes, are now rising on them, have been rising throughout this year and how this is making life incredibly difficult for them. And, um, you know, I could go into more details about this, um, but some of these top discussions were confidential. But um, what I would say is you're going to hear much more of this all the time. And of course, a lot of the people are saying that in, in specifically in Britain, by the way, this is not what we expected a conservative government to do. Conservative governments are supposed to be about lowering taxes, not raising them. But that's what the British government is doing. And of course, if one is talking about the Biden-Harris administration, well, they're going to do that on a far bigger scale. Because, of course, their spending, their money emission is vastly greater. And at some point, they have to try to balance the books. They just can't keep this up forever. And, you know, that inevitably means more taxes. Now, well, according to Biden, the $1.75 trillion is, is not going to cost the American people anything. It's, it's free. Zero. It's free. Zero it's free. It gets down in whispers <laughs> into the microphone all the time. It's not going to cost a thing, he says. Pay I your know. fair share. It, it's, Indeed. It's ridiculous. And going Indeed. off of just real quick, conservative government, I would tell them, Alexander, there is no conservative government. There's no. a globalist government. <laughs> I entirely agree with that, too. I mean, bear in mind, of course, that at the same time as, you know, uh, uh, Biden tells us that, you know, this, it's not going to cost anything. He's been busy negotiating this global corporate tax <laughs> thing, you know, that which is basically an attempt. I mean, what it is, in effect, is an attempt 
to make the US, to protect US competitiveness, even as US taxes rise. <laughs> now, it's not going to survive. It's another declaratory thing, because ultimately it's unenforceable. I mean, sooner or later, countries will start to cut their taxes or adjust their taxes to adapt them to their own needs. It's inevitable. It's bound to happen. Some suckers in Europe will be affected, but other countries will not. And as I said, it's, it's, a, it's another foolish policy, but again, it contradicts, in a sense, what the administration is saying. They're saying, on the one hand, you know, it's not going to cost you anything, at the same time as they're taking steps which clearly point to tax increases on, on businesses and on corporates. Yeah, I mean, the, the corporate tax is, it, once again, uh, the large multinational corporations are going to find a way to sidestep well, it. Yeah. And the only people that are going to get punished are going to be the small to medium-sized businesses, period. The big corporations that supposedly Biden is saying, oh, well, they're going to start to pay their fair share um, because they just can't have offices in Ireland and pay this much. They'll find a way to sidestep it. Do. And the countries in Europe that actually go along with this, that actually go along with this scheme of Biden's, they are chumps. Talk about destroying your domestic economy if they go along with this and don't try to figure out ways to also sidestep this corporate tax. They are complete suckers. That's entirely correct. That's so completely true. That is exactly right. That's that. I mean, the big corporations, the big name oligarchs, don't pay tax. I mean, that's it's it's for them. It's an optional thing. So, I mean, you know, all you're doing by this kind of policy is you are imposing taxes on the small and medium sized businesses, which are the businesses that the middle class are invested in and which form at the actual, the true backbone of national economies. But of course, the big global corporations, the globe, you know, globe spin spanning corporations, they're in not they they are not affected by this because, of course, they're not part. They're not they don't conceive of themselves any longer as national corporations, as say they once did in the United States. I mean, you know, today they think of themselves as global institutions. We're operating within a globalized economy and in a globalized world, and you know what nation states do really isn't of any concern to them is it time that we uh do away with these g20s and all these types of summits i mean they're, they're I, kind of useless it seems at this point i absolutely think so i mean I, I i think it's a complete waste of time i mean the g7 has ceased to be of any relevance or importance at all for a very long time the g20 at one point it looked as if it would be more promising because it, it brought in a more diversified range of countries than the G7. The G7 is just the United States and its friends. The G20 brought in the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, the Saudis, the Turks, all kinds of other people. But realistically, even that isn't working now. So there's just no point in continuing with these things. And the better, the sooner it's all ended, and we go back to a world in which economics are grounded, and that means grounded in actual societies represented through states, with people, with governments accountable to their people through proper elections. Until we return to that, we're going to see more magical thinking and fantastic policies uh, uh, like the, con the kind that we are seeing now. This administration has taken that process of magical thinking and magical language to the ultimate point. I, I, even I can't see how we can go beyond what, what they are uh, doing. But fantasy economics can only have a bad outcome. Well, we've said it many times. It's a fantasy. The whole thing is a fantasy. They've, they've built, uh, you know, Hollywood-like sets across from the White House. You know, they create, uh, they create productions where the vice president is, is speaking to child actors. The, the whole thing is a complete yeah. fantasy. 
Well, indeed. Well, let's remember the Democrats are the party of Hollywood. <laughs> so no doubt they've got plenty of people. And, you know, many people point out that Hollywood isn't producing movies that are as good as they used to be. And that might partly explain why all this presentation isn't quite as crack as good as, as it once was. But there we go. I mean, you know, it is, it's, it's fantasy stuff. And as I said, it's not sustainable in the, in the end. I wonder if, uh, if if splitting the world up like this, if say you, you just phase out the G20 or, you know, Russia, China, India, these countries just start to not give a crap about the G20 as they already are. They just don't care that much about any of these uh, meetings, these these globalist type of, type of meetings. But I wonder is, as we move in this direction, if uh, this increases the risk for, for conflict or decreases the risk for conflict, because it is the exact opposite of where the globalists want to take things i think in the short term it would increase the risk of conflict because of course we would see the globalists as you correctly say who don't want to see that happen because it is the opposite direction from the one they're going they would want to increase the pressure they would intensify the pressure on countries that were opting out of the system we would see more attempts at regime change probably more uh, um, actions like that in the long term it would stabilize is the situation and at that point what's the situation because what all these meetings are doing is that they're creating friction <laughs> they're bringing together leaders who don't really represent anything and who come up with fantasy ideas and because those aren't really practical because they don't really answer to people's actual needs they are creating deeper tension in the world now if you take that away you have a system, once again, based on sovereign states. Well, believe it or not, not only would you get more uh, a more stable international environment based on international law, you might actually get more international cooperation, real cooperation, than we are seeing today. Because then you would have real leaders accountable to their voters talking to each other instead of fantasy leaders coming up with fantasy declarations at fantasy summits. All right. We will leave it there. Everyone go to the Duran.locals.com, go to the Duran shop, 10% off, use the code real news and look for our videos on Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, and Super U. Take care.